This is Dennis McMahon, and welcome to Positively Vermont. Uh, my guest today is Oliver Person, who is the Lakes and Ponds Program Manager for the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. Welcome, Oliver. Thanks. It's great to be here, Dennis. And just uh, to get started, tell I know you've been on Positively Vermont before, but we we have a whole new show here and now uh, with a whole group of different listeners. Tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and your background. Sure. So I work in the Watershed Management Division of the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, or DEC, as you said. And my specific role is to manage uh, lakes and ponds in the state of Vermont. And so we will, what we do is handle all the regulatory and permitting uh, water quality monitoring, uh, shoreland property owner outreach, and aquatic invasive species prevention work uh, in Vermont's 800 lakes and ponds. Um, and so we have about 12 staff members, folks who are out either working with property owners to improve their shoreland so it doesn't contribute sediment runoff or pollutants into lakes to working on lakes to remove aquatic invasive species like Eurasian water milfoil, which can be harmful to aquatic habitat or get in the way of swimming and boating or looking at trends, you know, what's happening with our lakes? Are, are they, is the water quality improving? Is it getting worse? What are the impacts of climate change? What are the main sources of, of runoff into the lakes and, and how do we address those? Lake Champlain and, and Lake Memphremagog are some of our big ones where there's unfortunately waters that are impaired but efforts to improve water quality via phosphorus reduction plans. So we spend a lot of time working on, on those efforts in those lakes and in their watersheds. But there's another 800 lakes <clears throat> in the state that, that we try to get out to as well and, and work on the, the range of issues that I that I mentioned. And you know, in terms of my background, I, I have a, a, a natural resource management master's degree um, and have been doing water resource management and other similar environmental work uh, in Vermont and also outside the U.S. for for over 20 years. But I've been in this role since 2019, and it's a real privilege to work for for Vermont's Department of Environmental Conservation, work with Vermonters and our visitors to keep our lakes clean and to allow Vermonters to really benefit and enjoy the lakes for all the great uses they provide. Great. Well, I know that the, uh, the DEC partners with, with other agencies or institutions. Can you give us an idea of uh, how, uh, who and what uh, uh, entities are partners with uh, on these projects? Yeah, sure. So, you know, starting within the state of Vermont, we were in the Agency of Natural Resources. So we have two, what I call sister departments, Fish and Wildlife and Forest Parks and Recreation. So with Fish and Wildlife, we, we, we work with them real close on issues around if there are any lake management projects, how is that going to impact wildlife, how is that going to impact aquatic habitat, um, and are any manipulations we're doing to lakes uh, acceptable uh, in terms of the impact on, on, on habitat and, and wildlife species. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Department also manages the access areas where the public can can bring their boats and, and gain access to the lakes. And, and we work with them in those access areas to keep boats clean and prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species, which, which I think we'll talk about more later. Then Forest Parks and Recreation, they manage a lot of state parks on lakes and ponds, and we work with them to try to keep those shorelands, uh, you know, as lake friendly as possible. So, you know, if there's a huge lawn uh, right up to the lake, that's a source of runoff, but is also a great spot for recreation. We'll, we'll work with Forest Parks and Recreation to to maintain that lawn in a way that allows for recreation, allows for folks to enjoy a, a sunny afternoon at the lake, but minimizes runoff uh, into the lakes and ponds and keeps the, the water quality in those lakes as good as possible. So that's sort of within Vermont. We work with the Vermont Department of Health a lot on issues where where public health and lakes intersect specifically you know those blue green algae blooms also known as cyanobacteria those are unfortunately cropping up more and more in the hot summer months and those are both an environmental issue and also there's some these pose some health risks we work with vermont department of health there agency of transportation has lots of roads near lakes and ponds so we work with them to keep those roads uh, from dumping sediment and runoff in, into the lakes in terms of the federal government, we get a lot of money from different federal agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to support our programs in Vermont. So we, there's a lot of grant management as those funds come in, 
project implementation and then reporting back to those those federal partners but those funds are are really critical for us we're, we're very you know uh, we have a lot of gratitude to the sort of support that the federal government is providing and then you know in vermont there's a lot of organizations that are, are vermont based that we try to to partner with anything from conservation districts to lake associations, which are volunteer led, uh, that are really important uh, in terms of us achieving our goals of managing lakes and protecting lakes and protecting water quality. So those types of organizations uh, are critical. Um, you know, and then I guess the last thing I'd mention is some of our lakes stretch into other states and even countries. So we work with New York State, uh, New Hampshire, and then the province of Quebec quite a bit in some of these either international or multi-state, interstate waters and uh, have good collaboration and cooperation with, with those other jurisdictions. So, yeah, I think those are those are the key partners. Hope I didn't leave anybody really important out. That's great. I know we're going to be talking mostly today about uh, individual uh, and small boating safety, but can you give us an idea of some of the the larger transportation uh, that goes on? I know we have ferries to New York State. Sure. Uh, give us an idea of the scope of that and and how you make sure that uh, the environment is protected. Yeah, you know, I think you know when, when I think about transportation, I principally think about you know Lake Champlain connecting with the the canal to the Hudson River, and it's important to keep that waterway navigable. So Vermont, New York State, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers work together, and we receive funding from from the Army Corps of Engineers to remove an invasive plant that's common in in southern Lake Champlain, which is known as water chestnut. And if you if you've seen the the water chestnut down in Southern Lake Champlain, it can form a real mat across the uh, the water that, you know, can can really make it difficult for boats to get through. So we keep the the, the, the that waterway navigable so, so boats can continue to move from really from New York all the way down to the Hudson River in New York City, up through Lake Champlain and the, the Richelieu River and in, into Quebec, which which boaters do use. Um, you know, and we do a little bit on the Connecticut River as well. There are some invasive species there that we keep tabs on and try to prevent um, from spreading. Um, and again, the invasive species prevention work, as you mentioned, how does it impact the environment? We're trying to keep the environment as you know productive and and you know, receptive for native plants and native animals, and so these invasives get in the way of that. So hopefully, by removing the invasives, we're allowing our, our native species, our native plants and fishes and wildlife, et cetera, to to thrive. So that's that's one way we do. You know, in terms of transport, we don't have a lot of other lakes that are really important for sort of regional transportation, but some of them hook up with rivers and those those waterways we try to keep intact or at least educate the public about where there's dams or other things that they need to be aware of if they're trying to you know take a canoe from from one lake to another. Hopefully that that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Now I, I know it's a very large uh, scope, but uh, I don't even know if you could speculate on this, but do uh, you have any uh, view on how how are we in terms of the, the quality and the uh, navigability and the other uh, features of, of our uh, lakes and ponds? Uh, yeah. are, are we improving or are there some dangers going on? Sure, that's a great question. You know, Vermont is is lucky to, to and we're lucky in the DEC to be stewarding some of the highest quality lakes in the country. Uh, we overall, if you look at some of our indicators of, of water quality, things like what are the phosphorus concentrations, what's the water clarity, you know, how deep can you see? Um, we have some of the, the, the cleanest and, and best lakes in the state. We do have more shoreland development uh, around our lakes and very close to the water's edge than most other states. And that's because it wasn't until really 2014 that we passed the Shoreland Protection Act. Um, so that's one challenge. Overall, but overall, we're you know with a few exceptions, we're, we're lucky to have very clean waters. There are there are some threats, however, we're seeing increasing phosphorus levels in many of our lakes, including these really clean and pristine ones that are that are low nutrient. And what the increasing phosphorus can do is is stimulate plant growth um, and even lead to those blue green algae blooms I mentioned earlier. You know, and and uh, some plants aren't a bad thing. You know, they provide habitat for for fish, and you know that's that's a natural component of many of our lakes. But if if the phosphorus increases significantly, you know that's the limiting nutrient for plant growth. 
And so then you can really get into a situation where the plant growth goes beyond what, what you'd want, goes beyond what you'd see without the presence of humans. And then if an invasive plant comes along again, like Eurasian water milfoil or, or water chestnut, it can really take over the lake. Folks uh, who are familiar with Lake Iroquois, you know, may have seen, you know, before we did some lake management work there in 2021, that really much of the lake was covered with a thick mat of, of Eurasian water milfoil that prevented folks from swimming and boating and, and fishing. Um, so that's that's really one trend we're we're concerned about with our lakes is is the increasing phosphorus trends. We also have sort of the the, the international or global problem of of climate change that's leading to warmer summers, less ice, um, and the warmer summers create conditions in the lakes that unfortunately aren't great for for water quality. The, the 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 heat in the summer not only stimulates plant and algae growth, but it also creates this this thermal barrier where if you're swimming, you might sometimes feel the water is really warm at top, but then your feet hit a pocket of cold water. And then in that situation, your feet are poking through that thermal barrier. And when it's really hot, that, that thermal barrier is stronger. It's hot on top and oxygen comes into the lake from the wind on top, but down below where it's cold, that barrier prevents oxygen from getting down into the lake bottom. That can lead to fish kills when, there's, when the oxygen is depleted. And that can also lead to release of phosphorus from sediment in, in the lake bottom. So climate change is a real issue for, for lake health. And we're studying that, seeing what the impacts are, and hopefully Vermont's co contributing and participating in regional, you know, national and global efforts to you know, sort of mitigate uh, and adapt to some of the challenges associated with climate change. Great, thanks, Oliver. And what motivated uh, uh, our, our show uh, this week uh, was the uh, the, uh, the uh, announcement by uh, the Department of TIPS uh, for boating safety uh, on our lakes and ponds, but also safety in terms not only of navigation but the environmental and and, and other aspects you discussed. And uh, it, it's kind of a, a comprehensive list: uh, tips uh, before, while, uh, and after boating. And maybe we could run through uh, some of those, and sure. uh, we're going to be making the website uh, references available. But uh, start. I, I know that you started out, so I'm going to sort of run down, uh, you know, your list. Uh, talk about the rules. Uh, the first thing you talk about rules uh, of, of boating safety and environmental concerns. Tell us a little bit about that. Great. Yeah, I'll be happy to. I'll, I'll start by saying. We look at the Memorial Day weekend as the unofficial start of the, the boating season. Surely it's it's been pretty warm in Vermont in the last week, and, and today it's gonna we get might get up to 90. So it's that great time of year when you can get out on the water, you can get out on your boat, um, and really enjoy the lakes, ponds, and some of the rivers that are here in Vermont. And that's really part of the fabric of of, of life in Vermont in the summer. And we want to encourage Vermonters to to get out, to get out on our lakes and ponds, to use those access areas. Um, but to do it safely and to do it in a responsible and, and environmentally friendly way. And, and we, we try to do that through a number of different elements. The first thing, as you mentioned, is, is the use of public water rules. And so, you know, in Vermont, the lakes and ponds are, are, in, are held in the public trust for the, the benefit of all Vermonters and our, and our visitors. So there's no private ownership of, of, of lakes and ponds, you know, of, of the water that is. And, and most lakes and ponds have some public access and we want people to get out, um, but it's a shared resource. And so you, we, to avoid the tragedy of the common situation where everyone's just doing whatever they want uh, to the detriment of, of the general enjoyment of that resource, the state under statute uh, established some, some basic rules uh, that apply to all lakes and ponds, which I can talk about, and then some specific rules for, for individual lakes and ponds governing what type of activities and what type of vessels are, are permitted on those lakes and ponds. And so I think one fundamental rule that applies statewide to all waters is, you know, within 200 feet of the shoreline, motorized vessels can only generate, can only go at speeds of five miles per hour or less, or in a manner that doesn't generate a wake. And that's really to allow them to get away from shore, get away from swimmers, get away from other boaters very slowly. And once they hit deeper waters and are further from shore, they can then you know go faster and, and hit the gas on, on their boats. You know, of course, with, with certain speed limits in place on certain water bodies. So that's statewide and that's in statute. Then the use of public water rules has some other specific, you know, has some other statewide rules. But what it was really the power of that document is it lists 
uh, for lakes over 10 acres, you know, which is uh, over 100 uh, in, in the state. So really all the lakes where there's going to be any kind of boating going on, um, it lists, you know, what are the specific rules? Are, are motorized vessels allowed? or not. And in, in most cases, they are. There's the majority of our lakes and ponds allow motorized vessels. Our jet skis are also known as personal watercraft allowed or not. There's some specific rules about use of personal watercraft. They typically aren't used on, aren't permitted to be used on lakes and ponds below 300 acres in size. So it, it clarifies that. And then are there specific rules about water skiing? Are there specific speed limit rules? Um, that's, so those are the type of things that are available for the public to be aware of in, in the use of public waters rules. To find out you know, what's, what's, out, what's allowed on a specific water body, there's a number of different ways to, to do that. You can, you can search and find on our website the actual rules and, and go through the annex where it lists lake by lake what the rules are. So that's one option. We also have a, a website where you can just type in the name of the lake and the specific rules come up. And at the access areas, there's metal signs that say, hey, for this lake, uh, this is what's allowed and this is what's not allowed. And we, we try to get the word out to avoid conflict. You know, if, if a lake is off limits to personal watercraft or jet skis, but someone doesn't know that and they, and they show up and they've driven a half an hour with their jet ski on a trailer and they're really looking forward to getting out on their jet ski, it's, it's really disappointing for them to find out that that lake is off limits for jet ski use. So we try to avoid that and get these rules out into the public and make people aware of them. Um, and then my department, DEC, we, we administer the rules, but we don't enforce them. And so we rely on the, the Vermont State Police Marine Division and the Fish and Wildlife Department game wardens uh, to enforce the rules. And so if people see something that looks like it may be a violation, they can reach out to one of those two entities and, and report it. And then our, our colleagues in State Police and Fish and Wildlife will do their best to, to investigate that potential violation and take any necessary action. Um, so yes, the thinking behind the rules and the rules evolve over time. You know, sometimes people will say, hey, what, what, what used to be a normal use on this lake, you know, isn't really part of, of what, the, the recreation that's going on here, can we change the rule for this lake? And, and DEC will consider that. And there's a process for the public to propose changes and for us to review those and to either say, yes, we'll make the change formally or no, we don't accept this change and, and here's why. And we're in, we're in the midst of making a, a change to the rules about use of wake boats, which are a relatively new type of motorized vessel on Vermont's waters, which, which I can talk about if, if you're interested, Dennis. What about the idea of uh, personal safety? Uh, we're, we're starting now from the sure. uh, the point. Well, let's actually, because you, you do discuss this, uh, someone has the boat in dry dock or on a trailer. Uh, you recommend certain things be done before you put it in water. And then when you're in the water and then after the water, because you go through that process, which I know are described on your website. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, you know, Vermont has a, a great handbook out there of, of boating laws and, and responsibilities that, that summarizes that that's available on our website. Anyone that was born after January 1, 1974, needs to take a boater education course, pass a test and, and carry a boater education card, proving that they've taken that course with them in their boat. Um, and then we have lots of other resources is available, but you're totally right. You know, what we're trying to uh, help the public understand is, is as boaters, they have certain responsibilities to recreate on, on public waters um, safely. And, and these are described in that, that boating boater safety manual, but it's, it's things like you have to have a personal flotation device in, in a boat for each member, for each person that's in the boat, you know, at all times. And that's so that if the boat capsizes and you're way out in the middle of, of, of a large lake, uh, you're able to, to stay afloat until, until someone can come and rescue you or, or help you. And, you know, I think a lot of people think they're strong swimmers and they don't need it. But, you know, if you go out today, although the air temperature is very hot, you know, it might be up to 90 degrees, lake temperatures are still quite cool, 45, 50 degrees in some cases. And so it's it's difficult to, to swim long distances in, in, in those cooler temperatures so that that personal flotation device can really keep you alive um, in those circumstances. So we really rely on uh, those boaters understanding that rule um, and, and carrying those uh, with them. And the other thing is, you know, the, the, the use of public water rules and state statutes say that, that boaters need to keep 200 feet uh, from other boaters, from swimmers, from shore, um, 
and uh, other infrastructure like docks uh, if they're moving at speeds greater than five miles per hour at all times. And that, that 200 feet is meant to provide a, a wide berth uh, on the water so that you, you avoid any sort of collision or, or you know, the, the, the tragic situation where a boat actually hits a swimmer, which, which unfortunately has happened in Vermont. Uh, in the last 10 years, a number of occasions. So the, keeping that 200 feet distance from other boats and other people in the water, uh, swimmers, paddleboarders, what have you, uh, is is really important. And, you know, and, and so those are some of the elements of, of safety and this this boating safety handbook I mentioned goes over how to, what are some of the basics about maintaining your, your vessel, of, of trailering it in and out of, of the access areas or at the access areas in and out of the water. If you're navigating at night, what are some of the requirements about nighttime navigation? Um, and if you're doing things like water skiing, what are the specific rules there? So it's really a great resource and, and I encourage all boaters to, to find that. Again, the Vermont Boating Safety Handbook on our website, download it. It goes through some of the equipment you need to have on your boat, safety equipment in addition to personal flotation devices. We want folks to have fire extinguishers in the event that uh, a motor catches on fire and boaters are able to, to put that out before the hull of, of the boat is is damaged, you know, that type of thing. And, you know, this, I, I think folks are, are can appreciate that while going out on the water in their boat is, is all about having fun and enjoying the great weather and enjoying the beauty of the lakes and ponds. We want people to, to come home in one piece and, and be able to do it again the next day. And so this, these laws and safety equipment are, are all with that goal uh, in mind, get out on the water, have fun, get home and, and, and do it again the next day. So, yeah, those are some of the the key elements of, of boating laws and responsibilities that we, p we put out there. And, you know, the state police Marine division and, and the game wardens do get out on the water in their boats and, you know, they have the right to interact with boaters and, and, and check that they're following these rules and, and address any situations where uh, there's a lack of compliance with the rules. And certainly that would include, uh, include the use of alcohol and drugs. Uh, is a you're exactly right. Yeah, that's that's specifically covered in the the Vermont Boater Safety Handbook, but that is prohibited. Um, and that's so a tough one for people to swallow. But the rules are it's it's similar to driving. You know, you shouldn't think about operating a boat vis-a-vis -vis alcohol and drugs any different than you think about operating a car. That's great. Well, one of the things uh, you mentioned now, uh, you have all the guidance about operation and and safety and uh, some of the navigation rules you mentioned, but. Uh, what I'd like to just focus on briefly is uh, someone has their boat and they take it out uh, of the lake or the pond. And you have some recommendations about inspecting things because that might yep. turn something up of interest to your department. <laughs> yeah, great question. So, you know, we have many lakes, over 100, that, that unfortunately are, are infested with aquatic invasive species. You know, the most common is, is Eurasian water milfoil, which is a plant that that is is very successful at, at growing in our lakes and ponds and spreads very quickly and is, is difficult to contain, almost impossible to eradicate. And it can form these really thick mats, which are, are very hard to swim or paddle through, which can mess up your propeller if you're trying to motor through them. And, and you really decrease the quality of, of aquatic habitat overall uh, for most wildlife species. And so we're, you know, in the midst of a probably a uh, perennial battle to limit the spread of milfoil on water bodies where it's already established and more importantly to keep it out of, of water bodies where it's not and what we found is that boats and trailers are the principal vector for spread of, of milfoil and, and other invasives uh, like zebra mussels, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, from one water body to another and that's that's been proven and so what we try to do is establish uh, the vessel inspection stations at the access areas. And so when you, when you, you, you register your motorboat, you pay a fee and some of that fee goes to paying uh, for these folks at the access areas who will inspect your boat. And so when you pull up to the access area uh, on some lakes, they're known as greeters on other lakes. They're known on Lake Champlain. They're known as stewards. And those are funded by the, the federal government and implemented by the Lake Champlain basin program. These folks will, will, will approach you and, ask you some questions. And if, if, you've, if you're coming from another water body and in the last two weeks, they'll ask if they can inspect your boat uh, to see if there's any evidence of, of milfoil or other invasive on the boat's hull, on any of the apparatus, you know, the motor and whatnot, or on the trailer. Um, 
and and they'll also ask if they can do that again uh, on on the way out to prevent spreading if you're in a going coming out of a lake with uh established populations of aquatic invasive species and what they also ask boaters to do and this is this is the key is when they bring their boat out of the water to clean it drain it and dry it and and the clean drain dry approach is actually required under vermont state statute we have a there's a piece of statute about transporting of, of vessels uh to minimize or reduce the risk of spreading aquatic invasive species and both the inspection that i mentioned and the clean drain dry principles are covered in that and i, you know, I think folks can can appreciate you know, if they're on a lake without aquatic invasives and, and, and enjoying the the recreation there then you think of another lake that's infested you really don't want that that problem to spread uh to to another lake and and so really that's the the purpose of the clean drain dry approach you know and and the the greeters and the stewards they have to get the boaters permission um and, and they while they have uh state statute backing them up to do that it's it does uh require the boater to say yes so we really encourage boaters to allow these greeters and stewards to to inspect their boats and if they they find any evidence of of um aquatic invasive plants or animals on them to allow the, the gritters to remove them. And some of the really busy and, and popular access areas where there are, uh, where there's, where the adjacent lake has aquatic invasives, those have decontamination stations where either coming into the water or coming out of the water, depending on where your boat's been before and where you're going after, uh, you can decontaminate your boat, you know, which really involves spraying it uh, with sort of high pressure water. Sometimes that water is, is heated to a certain temperature, uh, which can kill the, the aquatic invasives. And that's the way we, we, we decontaminate a boat that might have uh, aquatic invasives present on them. And so, you know, Vermont's really uh, trying to do more of this. And we're, we're fortunate to have funding from different federal partners to purchase more of these decontamination units uh, next door in New York. They're, they're a bit ahead of us and their, their law actually makes this, this decontamination legal requirement on some water bodies like, like George, for example, and they have better established decontamination stations. So we're trying to learn from them, do a better job educating the public about the importance of decontaminating and inspecting your boat if you're moving it from one water body to another and then implementing these inspection and decontamination programs at, at more access areas. The, the funding is tricky. You know, the, the funding so far has been limited to pay for these programs from the motorboat registration funds and, and some grant funding from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer. But in the state fiscal year 24 budget, which should start in July, uh, the, the legislature did give us some additional funding to support uh, aquatic nuisance control prevention measures, which we're really happy about. We hope that budget is signed into law soon and we can begin to plan to use those funds <clears throat> in the future. But really it's it's important to for all boaters to understand that the clean drain dry has has really good intentions of preventing the spread of aquatic invasives keeping them out of water bodies where they're not and limiting the spread in water bodies where they're they're already established and we hope they'll work with us on those those actions at the access areas well that's great well thank you very much oliver uh the, the website uh, can you just uh, shout that out now where this information can be uh, found yeah, it's in a few different places, um, but, you know, the Vermont uh, DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation, Lakes and Ponds website has information on the use of public water rules, the, the border safety manual, and, and what, what, what the specific rules are for each water body, um, as well as on the, our efforts to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species, um, and links to the boater safety manual are also available there. The Fish and Wildlife Department has a great website that describes all the access areas, where they are with, with maps, uh, and, and what type of vessels are, are able to uh, come in and out of those access areas, how much parking there is, uh, if there's a dock or not. So that's that's a great website as well if you're, if you're curious for more details uh, on the access areas. Um, so I think those would be the best two places to, to start to learn more about safety, using the public waters and preventing the, the spread of aquatic invasives, as well as your requirements as a boater uh, to, to fulfill before heading out on the water. Great. Well, thank you very much, Oliver. And uh, uh, we'll look forward to uh, having you again uh, uh, visit Positively Vermont uh, as the seasons change. And uh, I just want to say uh, it's been very interesting. And, and please consult uh, uh, those uh, sites and uh, uh, very helpful uh, people in, in your department. 
Uh, this is uh, Dennis McMahon. My guest has been Oliver Pearson, uh, the Lakes and Ponds Program Manager for the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. Thank you for watching.